Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello, it's Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 70, yay, and my thanks to you all for staying with me. I have been outrageously pressured the last few weeks over work, and it's no big deal. It's just uh, I've added more work is what I would say about that. So I'm going to try and kick this one out as quickly as I can. Here in the Warm Thanks Department, thank you once again, Chris H., for a very generous coffee. I'm not sure I'm worthy because I've been so spotty and irregular with these episode postings. So I really, really do appreciate it. Let me tell you. Oh boy, moving on to the usual COVID stuff. I'd have to say that the newest excitement there, of course, is everybody's running mask-free here in LA County, which is odd because we haven't really reduced our level of infection. The CDC simply changed its rules, but okay. And I think at this point, you just have to say it's your own decision. I am surprised how many people are still wearing masks and I just choose to. Now I don't wear a big N95 anymore. I am wearing cloth masks with filters inside them that happen to be N95 level. It's true. And I think you have to make your own best decision on this. I still am in the place of, you know, guys, if we stay masked up and we all get our vaccinations and all that stuff, we could actually get rid of this thing. So this idea of every time we look close to normal, we just stop all the precautions strikes me as a little dumb. I also find it interesting that veterinary and medical facilities have not changed anything. (laughs) So, you know, I think these are the people who actually know about infection and they're being really careful. Makes you think, doesn't it? But you have to do what you want. What you really need to know from me, aside from the stuff I normally say, is that in my show notes, which can be found on our Ravelry group and also at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, you will find the links that you need for COVID. One for your vaccine card and the other for your free COVID tests. Now, you remember the free COVID tests. You could get four for free. Well, they're on to round two, guys. So if you already got your four COVID tests, go back and get four more. And this time, I ordered them like 15 minutes after I saw that they were available, and they came two days later. So I now have my COVID tests stacked up here in the studio of love. So if you want your free COVID tests, we're on round two. You can get four more of them if you already got them once. Or you can get them for the first time. What, you may be asking, is on my hooks and needles? Well, I finished one sock of the watermelon rind socks. I have to admit, I just sat down with these and raced through them. I think it's kind of a revenge for getting so hung up on the Yule socks for so many weeks that I just seriously sat down on sock number one and and I just could not stop. I used to always do my socks with afterthought heels and when I finished the whole tube then I would not do the heel. I would go do the second sock. I seem to have changed that habit and now I do the whole sock and move on to sock number two. Sock number two, in case you want to ask, is actually past the heel. I've gone all the way down the seven inches of leg and put in the two rows of waist yarn, and I'm now working my way down the foot. So these things are just racing. I'm not sure what it is. I'm using Oink Pigments. Uh, Their yarn is just called Sock, and it is in watermelon rind. This is definitely a sock yarn, that it's got a stripe. Now with Oink, I think I am a little, I haven't figured out, I think I'm a little bit, 
different than other people. I tend to do my socks on size two needles. I tried one and a half and I didn't like it. And I've got the fit, as you can see in my picture there, of my right foot in its new sock. I've got the fit down with size two needles. But my stripes always come out just a little bit irregularly with oink. And I think that comes out of two things. Well, the obvious thing is my tension does not agree with their tension when they knit. So I have a slightly different tension than they have. I suspect somewhat looser, which is odd for me. I'm usually the one who knits tighter than everybody else, but still, uh, I, I don't quite match that. And the other thing that I think contributes is the stripes alternate wide stripe of solid color with narrow stripes of accent colors. And I have found that with that kind of pattern, no matter who is dyeing this, you have to really match their gauge. And if you're not matching their gauge, it's going to look kind of weird and pooly. And I think I just don't quite match the gauge on Oink. Also, if you look up Oink on Ravelry, you will see that every other breathing human does match their gauge. Because I happen to think Oink is brilliant dyer. I, happen to, I love their stuff. I don't just like it. They're absolutely hands down one of my favorites. But I have to be real that for some reason I haven't had good success with this type of stripe with them, with the wide band followed by the narrow bands. So, you know, what I would tell you is when you look at, the reason I'm saying all this is I don't think this is on Oink. I think they're terrific. I think this is me. And when you look at that picture and you're going, eh, it looks a little off, just a little, you have to realize that one of the goals here is to match your gauge to theirs. And you really do need to practice, and it really does show you how important gauge and needle size are. In my world, I don't care enough. <laughs> I know that's terrible. It really shows you how big a sock yarn stash I have, that I just don't care enough. And I happen to love these. I really like the colors. I really like the way they're coming out. So please, if you look at that picture and you're thinking, that is a wonky sock. Please don't blame Oink. Please blame me. You know, part of our skill set is to get gauge. And this is a pretty clear example that I didn't, and I'm not worried enough about it. And I can't help it. I love the colors. I just love these. And I, I'm i tearing through them for, for precisely that reason. <laughs> but I should be working on gauge. I know what you're all thinking. Oh, you're thinking Dr. Gemma is so lazy, so lazy. In progress, the don't know yet crocheted blocks. Did you know it's National Crochet Month? Who declares these things? I mean, who who comes up with that? How how can you tell that this is National Crochet Month, particularly since it's National Women's History Month. Who makes these decisions? Anyway, the don't know yet is now a few blocks past the one block a day mark since January 1st. I'm not sure how many blocks passed, but it is really encouraging because I had so much extra yarn from the temperature blanket last year that literally I had a carton and it was overflowing. And now the yarn in it is slowly sinking so that the top of the yarn is only slightly over the top of the carton edges with the side flaps folded down. So what I'm really saying to you is I got Boku yarn for this baby. I got yarn for years. I'm hoping it's only a queen size or maybe a king size. And it's a lot of fun and I'm still enjoying it. I am slow on these things. You would think at this point I'd race through these blocks, but I think they take me about 15 to 20 minutes and they're not big blocks. And they're not dense. I'm doing them in half double crochet. And I'm doing, I chained 27, I think. And I haven't counted how many stitches. That should make in a half double crochet. Uh, oh, I can't even think. I can't even think. I'm so tired right now. Anyway, they're not big blocks. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I think they're five inches by five inches. And yet, they take me so long. And yet, I love this. Now, my latest challenge is figuring out how many blocks am I getting out of one skein of the yarn, which is a Knit Picks Sport Weight Brava in acrylic, which is why I'm doing a blanket or whatever I make out of it in the end will be some form of blanket, I guess, or throw or both or more than one, because I don't really use acrylics for anything else. I don't really like them with the exception. I have some very happy acrylic vests that I made when I wanted to learn to crochet myself vests and fit them to myself. And those were in a self-striping from Lion brand that I just fell in love with on the shelf and they were on sale for like two bucks. So each vest cost me like four bucks or something insane like that. But anyway, 
I'm not using these for that. I really don't think a vest out of crocheted squares, I don't know if I've got that kind of skill. But I'm really enjoying the don't know yet, because I don't know yet, but it's really satisfying. I've got a a huge carry bag stuffed with squares, and I'm on carry bag number two. The Noro Heart Scarf, I have not yet touched. And I'm thinking if I get through the second sock, or if I get any bandwidth, because I've been, I've just been on a very tight schedule at work, and I just don't have the bandwidth to sit down and do intarsia carefully and lovingly so that I don't get gaps in it. I happen to love that scarf, and it's really not a hard pattern to do. I think it comes out to be six hearts, and I think I've got one and a half of them done. This should not take a long time, is what I'm saying, but I just can't seem to get to it. I did pull out the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery that I started in like 2016 or 17, and I bogged down in that because I was doing it for my office in the workplace from hell, and I just had to walk away and get away from those associations. And now that I've come back to it, I find it breathtaking. And there's a picture of it in the show notes. And I ripped out one of those hearts, one of the top pink hearts, because I was trying to do a variegated satin stitch. And it just didn't come out looking right. The one on the right looks okay. The one on the left really didn't. So I pulled that out this week and cut out that heart. And I need to go back and try it again. But it's really fun to get the embroidery out again. I really do enjoy embroidery and this I think is simply going to be a hanging in the office but I'd really like to get a sampler kit there's some really wonderful people on Etsy these days doing embroidery again and this is just freehand embroidery and I thought oh you know a sampler would be a lot of fun and very straightforward if I do a sampler what I'm really likely to do is just get a bunch of different stitches and some kind of stitch dictionary and then design my own pattern because I'm so happy with my Pennsylvania Dutch design. It's so pretty. If you look right below that, you will see me in what I was wearing this week because I was so happy with it. I pulled the Vestuary 2022 vest out, the one that is in the steel blue from Albrigo Rios, the Cielo y Tierra, and suddenly realized it goes with everything and pulled out one of my favorite scarves that I hardly ever give airtime to because the colors don't quite go with me. But it's beautiful. It's an it's a, an entrelac scarf made in Noro, I believe that's Silk Garden. And it just works beautifully with that vest and with that turtleneck shirt I'm wearing underneath it. So you can see me there wearing the Malabrigo Rios vest. And you can't see much of the vest. It's very dark compared to everything else in the picture. But you can see my lovely entrelac scarf. If you have not tried entrelac, XRX Books has a wonderful book, Introduction to Entrelac, and I, I cannot recommend that book enough. It is so good. It will teach you to make everything you could possibly want, but it will also teach you how to make samplers of the squares and get a feel for how the squares work in Entrelac. And it, it's so beautiful. And, of course, the yarn that's made for it is basically Noro, any self-striping Noro, in a, a worsted weight just looks terrific. And of course what you do with that is you play with the squares a little bit until you get a square dimension that makes a fit out of each stripe. And it, it just comes off looking great as you can see in that picture. And it's just a wonderful scarf to be honest and it's a wonderful colorway and I just I love those colors. It's it's um, really a kind of blend of blue grays that comes out looking like a medium blue. And then this very wonderful coral and then two different shades of cream, and then everything in between. I just love it. Let's see what else is going on. Well, not much going on in anything else. I'm going to hop down to the strategy. I am continuing to carry the two pages I mentioned in episode 69, which is the link to the page from former President Obama called Help Ukraine, and then the link to the page from Lovecraft, which are other ways to help the Ukrainians, if you ignore the idea that you just crochet yourself a blue and gold heart for no particular reason. All that does is helps a yarn manufacturer, <laughs> which is not a bad thing to do, but still doesn't make sense to me why that's on a Help the Ukraine page. I guess show support counts, but I think talk is cheap. I think you want to actually do things to help the people in the Ukraine. But in the strategy, 
we are still talking about emotional management strategies. And I'm straying a little from the path of DBT because now I'm talking about overall emotional management. And emotional management in dialectical behavioral therapy really means what are the things you do every day to help keep your emotions stable, to keep them from bouncing up and down like a crazed ping pong ball on a rubber floor, you know? And so, you know, in DBT, we teach mental health strategies, but I think there are some really straightforward life strategies that get dropped out of this. Now, this is challenging. When I first became a clinician, I'm working in a children's clinic and I'm told develop a group and I look at all these kids. So I say, I wanna do an exercise group. And I had done that in an inpatient facility in my internship. Well, my boss poo pooed it and sent me to the director who couldn't stop laughing and said, that is out of our scope. We can't do physical health. That is the dumbest thing and it's true, by the way, in those days, it was quite true. She was quite right. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, that in that clinic, it was a children's clinic, and easily three quarters of the patients were morbidly obese, not just a little obese. And how could we sit there and talk to them about their feelings for an hour when what they really needed was to run and play? And they weren't getting to do it, and they were eating junk food, and... So, you know, we should have been teaching cooking classes and lifestyle classes. And actually, eventually we did get some paraprofessionals. I miss you, Darren, and I always will, who were doing some of that. But again, you can't maintain your emotional health if you're not taking care of your physical health. One of the key ways is to manage your environment. And for me, that's really summed up in the phrase detox your environment. And there's so much that goes into it. First of all, if you think of it very literally, get the toxins out of your environment, get them out of your body, get them out of your house. So yeah, stop buying things in plastic, switch to glass containers if you safely can. Now, remember, if you have little kids, no, no. And I'm not gonna judge you for using plastic containers, I did, because you can't have glass breaking around the house. If you have kids who are hyperactive or highly impulsive and don't control themselves, you're gonna be very, very careful with this. Having said that, one of the great experiences of my life in, I think it was, I can't remember if I did it in late 2019 or if I actually waited for the quarantine. It was about that time was when I got the plastic out of my bathroom. And that has been so good for my health in so many ways, I can hardly describe it. For one thing, instead of using plastic bottles for all my hair products, I went to glass. And then I began to look at my hair products. And then I looked at my hair and said, seriously? And I went to all natural bar, soap bars for my hair and also for my skin. And like, this was like a cascade. One thing just led to another. And next thing I knew I had glass bottles and it was buying uh, pellets of soap that you just put in the bottom of the bottle and fill the bottle with water. And so you have far less waste. These things are coming in biodegradable cardboard little containers so they can go into a landfill and will biodegrade. They could actually go in your garden. Um, so it's interesting because when I thought about just detoxing the bathroom, suddenly I became a lot more aware of the health of my body. My hair is drastically improved. It, I wish I had known this 40 years ago. I finally have nice hair for the first time in my life. My hair is behaving itself. It's not all dried out. It's not ripping and breaking, although it is very fine. So it was interesting for me that detoxing the bathroom actually detoxed a lot of stuff for me. And these are kind of personal decisions. I don't wear makeup. I'm allergic to a lot of it. But again, my allergies improved when I detoxed my bathroom. So, you know, if you're looking at something like that, if you must wear makeup, if you must do stuff in your hair and dye your hair and all that, there are better options. There are options that are not as toxic on your head. And somebody did a study now, I think in the 90s, it was really horrifying where they just sampled the blood of men and women in America and looked at their chemical content and found they had these huge amounts of chemicals that don't belong in the body floating around in their bloodstream which isn't good because that's not good for your liver. And let's not forget when your liver's having problems, diabetes, among other things. So 
detoxing your environment is a you know that's a very literal way to interpret what I'm saying is when I say detox your environment but there are other good ways to detox it you can cut down your noise pollution and for me again this was the nine to nine screens plan where I turn everything off at 9 p.m. at night and I just write in my journal and then I don't turn anything on till nine in the morning when I go back to work and I warm up everything for my working day because I see my first patient at 10 but at nine I start doing any paperwork that I might need to do to prep for the day. So detoxing is also getting screens out, you know, putting a limit on how much screen time you spend so that you can sleep better at night. And yeah, that particular detoxing finally fixed my sleep, a problem I've had most of my life. You can get noise out of your life. You genuinely, you just feel better. You just relax because you don't have the noise. So detoxing covers a lot of ground. Detoxing is also exercising that you need to process garbage out of your body. You need to sweat it off and work it off. So exercising, but detoxing is also, and I say this sitting in a room full of clutter, it's decluttering. And decluttering is a skill unto itself. A lot of different systems are out there. One of the most effective I've ever heard, or at least for me, was take responsibility for just a small space. So in one extreme case, the therapist said to the patient who was a college student, I want you to clear one quarter of your desk. And every day you keep that one quarter clear, whatever you do with everything else. Well, and what happens is you can work on that quarter of the desk. You simply make sure that when you're finished for the day, it's tidied up, it's clear. And of course, what happens is usually the the subject involved begins to enjoy that quarter of the desk and gradually begins to clear everything else out. The other thing that has worked well for me is one thing a day, that my desk gets to be a nightmare fairly routinely, as does my craft table. And instead of saying, I'm going to clean that today, I just say, I'm going to clear off one thing per day. And that just means I have to take responsibility to get one thing off it. I'm looking at my table, which is now crowded again. I had detoxed it a few weeks ago. And again, my study is a problem, you know, and the idea is in our house, I started with the common areas. So I decluttered the living room and the dining room and the kitchen. My husband was really instrumental in the kitchen. The kitchen is very hard for me to declutter. I like everything right at hand. The cat also interfered. Yeah, you, she's over here on the couch behind me. Because when I tried to arrange things in a pretty way on the windowsill, she gets on the windowsill to watch the birds and knocks everything off. So you have to work around all this. But decluttering is a great way to detox your environment. So, you know, when you're going to try and feel emotionally better, you can't feel emotionally better in a hoard, in a space filled with so much stuff. And hoarders will tell you, oh, no, I feel better because all this stuff is right here if I need it. And then they usually can't even identify what their uses might possibly be. But hoarding is a pretty normal thing, particularly under stress, when people feel like they're losing power or losing control, which is why you see so many elderly people hoarding. And it's happening a lot in the current environment. Between the pandemic and the Ukraine, people are going to hoard out of anxiety. It's a means of security, like I got what I need, whatever else goes wrong. Rich people, of course, are the extreme version of this that you don't need to be a billionaire. What are you doing with all of that? Like what, <laughs> making more of it. And you know, it's, it's not like he who dies with the most toys wins. They're, they're beyond the level of safety. They're perfectly safe. They, they, they would be safe for 25 lifetimes. So, you know, hoarding is about insecurity and lack of safety and lack of security. You most often see hoarding in case you're wondering in families where the father is missing there, or if you have a father who you can't rely on, that's usually what makes hoarders. But again, the elderly aren't having that problem. They're just feeling like they're lost and they don't have enough. And so they hoard. I don't mean to get onto that. All right. So the important thing, though, is detox your environment, you know. And one of the great ways to do it, by the way, my favorite is my paper shredder. Uh, when I got a shredder and I got a free scanning app on my phone, I still do this. I shred all my bills and everything. And about once every two weeks, I go out and dump all the shreds into the trash bin and I just record everything to PDF and save it. So all my paper files have gone away 
and now I've just got a little tiny hard drive, a four terabyte hard drive that's the size of my palm. So, you know, detoxing is that too. Detoxing is change your filing system. You know, you don't have to give things up. You just have to use your space more effectively. But yes, it improves your mood. Tons of research on that. In the meantime, put a lid on it. I don't really have anything, but I did try out my bath bombs that I got from the two little girls on the internet site, on the craft site, and I don't like them. And I don't like them because they do exactly what the girls said they would do. They fizz. But they're not really great for your skin. Now there's cornstarch in them and what was it? Baking soda and essential oil and that's where you get the goodness. Cornstarch is, is nice on your skin too, I believe. But I would really ha rather have Epsom salts because of course, as we all know, Epsom salt is magnesium carbonate and you want to absorb as much magnesium as you can through your skin because your skin absorbs it better than your digestion does. So lying in an Epsom salt bath is way better than taking magnesium supplements. And you will sleep better, you will feel better, it deodorizes your skin, it's just a really nice thing. So these things, I dropped a bunch of them in my bathtub and they fizz beautifully and they smell great and then they're gone. <laughs> so I realized I'm back to the drawing board. I want to do better bath bombs. The other thing is I'm looking at my magnificent collection of canning jars and I'm thinking I'd really like to get rid of a few of those and I'd really like to save a bunch of them for storage with permanent plastic lids that you can buy at Amazon or Walmart or something. They're, they're, you can find them. They're easy enough. Ball sells them. People who sell the jars. Okay. And I realized they're amazing for storing all those things that you used to store in plastic. They're great for that. And they're pretty in the kitchen as long as you dust them every so often. And so I'm looking at them and saying, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to make bath bombs per se. That even though they're fun, it's fun to have a nice little unit you can drop in your bathtub. The storage function there is not satisfying environmentally. I've experimented with shrink wrap and I found myself looking at it and saying, do I really want to put that shrink wrap plastic into a landfill somewhere? So yeah, I may have a few more experiments to use up what I've got, but I don't think I want to go that route. Yeah, that heat gun's really nice though. I have other uses for it happily. Like warming me up. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, but I'm looking at all these options and I'm thinking, okay, so I need a better recipe. And I'm looking is all I can say. And, you know, meanwhile, I got a lot of little experimental bath fizzies. I'm sure everybody's getting one for Christmas and they'll go into stockings and all the people at work and all that sort of thing. Oh shoot, I've been terrible at it. I really have been working around the farm and not getting out to exercise today. In case you're wondering, Roxy, remember our pony who we've now had for eight years? Roxy today, my husband was freaking out because Roxy was just lying down. And I realized, well, she is 18 years old now. She's not as young as she used to be. And it was so funny because she never used to lie down in front of us. Well, after eight years with us, I think she's decided she can. So I went out. My husband said, something's wrong. She won't get up when I come over. And then I looked down and he's got her up on her feet. And I looked at her and I said, hey, how are you doing? And she cuddled with me. And I said, mama loves you, Roxy Pony. And she was so warm and furry and happy. And she wanted to be petted and loved. And then I said, you know, her ears are forward. She looks really healthy. She's not showing any distress. I said, I think she's just taking a nap in the sun because we've had windstorms for weeks. And I think she got a warm, sunny patch away from the wind and was just taking a nap in the warm sun. And I had to laugh. She, I went out later and she was lying there looking at me with her head on the ground and all four feet were extended. And I looked at her feet. Her feet looked beautiful. You know, the frogs inside her hooves, everything looks great. So in case you're wondering, she's still out there, but I'm not riding and I'm not exercising. I'm, I'm really a little large for her. And now our son is too. She's become a pasture pal. In the fluffy books, well, it's time for fluffy videos. You may remember I was watching the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I have to tell you, it's really interesting because of course, as we kind of all hoped it would, it starts discussing race. And uh, it, it's, it's very nice that it does. I'm laughing because it really went in directions I didn't expect it to go. One of the prime moments is where Marvel parodied itself. And that is, so you have the Falcon, who's a man of color, Sam. 
And you have the Winter Soldier, who is not surprisingly really white with a name like that, Bucky. And, uh, you know, Bucky's supposed to have been born in, like, the 19-teens or something. And he's done the Captain America thing. Okay. And in one of the great moments, because Sam has given up the shield that the original Captain America presented to him, hoping that Sam would become the next Captain America, Sam's given it up, thinking it's going to the Smithsonian. Turns out, no, the American government gives it to some white guy, John, I think his name was, and they make him Captain America. And he's not a super soldier. He's just a really talented soldier who's got four Congressional Medal of Honors for conspicuous bravery. And and that's kind of painful. He's obviously he's blonde and blue eyed and white skinned. And so everybody keeps saying to Sam, do you realize they're doing this, that you were supposed to be Captain America and they're doing this? They're giving it to another blonde haired, blue eyed white guy. Like America is always going to be represented by that. And there's a moment where Sam and Bucky get together, you know, and Sam's clearly leading their duo that Sam is directing Bucky because Bucky's really still emotionally unstable. So there you have the black man with the white sidekick and they don't say it as such. In fact, it's it's a little bit debated, but it's pretty clear that's what's going on. So they go to meet the Captain America and he's standing there in all his blue eyed, blonde hair glory. And he says, and here's my sidekick and it's a black guy. And what I love is, you know, that's exactly what Marvel did. They they made the Falcon in the 60s. The Falcon was supposed to show how racially integrated Marvel was that they gave a white superhero a black sidekick, you know. And they called him the Black Falcon in those days. I was there. I do remember this. And so there's Marvel having a good one on itself because Sam and Bucky, who are actually, you know, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they look at this combination and, and it's Bucky who goes, oh my God, no, and just walks away like, I've had it, I've had it, because it's so embarrassing, because it really shows the mistake that keeps getting made over and over again, that you have this white hero and a black attachment. And they really play it out painfully. I don't want to give spoilers, but if you think about it, you can tell who's going to be the red shirt here, and he is, and uh, they just play that out to its conclusion. And they're, they're trying so hard to balance the argument all the way through it. Do they succeed? Not at every moment, but they're really trying to talk about it. And I don't, like I said, there's some really great things. Like they do this really clever examination of how black soldiers were used in the Second World War that while everybody's glorifying the original Captain America, black soldiers are being experimented on with the super soldier serum to make Captain America the white man, what's his name? I can't even remember, Steve Rogers, to make him the experimental black soldiers, which is very similar to things going on in the Second World War, let's put it that way. So is a very, very smart examination. Now it falls flat when you get to Asians. Once you introduce a discussion of race, everybody's race is now hyper-determined, like, you know, uh, in, in literary terms, we call it over-determined, but that's not meant to be negative. It just means you're going to look at every character's race from this point on because they're making arguments about race. So the way they use Asians is pretty awkward, but I guess they don't count enough. And then, of course, they run into the gender issue because once you talk about race, you can't talk about black men unless you're going to talk about black women and then they awkwardly back into what about white women the gender thing now it is beautiful when the wakandan uh army of amazing warriors who also happen to be female shows up and th there's a great line where they basically say we are a rule unto ourselves and uh i'm not going to try and interpret that it's just great it's just great that they take that on the white woman thing is just really awkward um, that they just don't know what to do about it. So white women are just kind of weirdly manipulative and or they're descended from heroes, but they're still evil. Yeah, that didn't work too well. But, you know, I give them a lot of points for taking on race. And the problem is, again, that's a, you know, it's a hugely important issue, obviously. But once you do it, you have to be very, very careful with everything else because it becomes easy to morph over to talking about sex and gender. It becomes easy 
to say somebody's got to be tokenistic and give us background. It, it gets awkward. But I really give them a lot of credit because it is still one of the most intelligent attempts to discuss race that I've ever seen. And the fact that it tries to deal with where this is all coming from in the past and brings it into the present and then really is very gutsy for Marvel that they start kind of deconstructing Captain America, who's always been their flagship character. So I, I really like that. So it is worth watching. Whether or not you agree with it, go watch it and see what you think. It certainly makes you think, and anything that makes me think this deeply is going to be valuable to me. Having said that, I watched Hawkeye. <laughs> a lot lighter in its content. A lot lighter. Uh, there is a nice undercurrent of why a man? Why do we keep saying it takes a man to do these things? Uh, I'm not sure that I think the solution to women's problem is for women to get militarized and become physically violent. This is what I struggle with in the Wakanda movies as well. I enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy watching it. <laughs> but I'm not sure if I think that's the goal. Uh, the goal is choice, to be honest. The goal of feminism always is to give everybody the most choices possible in appropriate feminism. But anyway, um, I liked Hawkeye a lot is all I can say. I didn't expect to because it was an urban setting. I like that, again, they start talking about the past doesn't go away, that you are going to be held responsible for actions. And it does try to talk about if you're going to be a hero, what you sacrifice. And I like that a lot. I like the the female sidekick. I, I like a lot about it. I just had a whole lot of fun with it. Yay, death characters. Yay. Uh, of course, it hurts that when Hawkeye is using ASL, he's getting it wrong. But still, I like the fact that they were using it. I'm not good enough to follow it, but his was so bad. I'm like, yeah, okay, no, he's getting that wrong. Uh, but it's you know, yay, for what do, you, what do you know? There are people in the world who have hearing issues. And that's really in the foreground that they're talking about what heroes sacrifice and they get down to what, I think his name is Clint, has sacrificed. And part of it is his hearing. He's wearing hearing aids now. And he's learning sign because he's hard of hearing. And he can get by with a hearing, with at least, I think he's only got one hearing aid. But it was really nice to see how much ASL was in it. It was really nice to say, yes, by the way, speaking of underrepresented groups, and it's nice to realize, yes, that deaf people are participating fully. Can we ever get them out of the villain role or the bystander role or the I kind of made a sacrifice role so I'm deaf as opposed to, hey, I'm a normal functioning part of society and I happen to be deaf? Well, we're working on it. Something I really like, I ordered another set of my sleep headphones and I put the link and I put a picture of the latest set. It is 20 bucks of pure relief. I love these things. If you are in any kind of shared room, a dorm or your husband's bed, you know, you and your husband together in your bed, I should say, you're going to love these things. I've had my pair now for well over a year. I use them almost nightly. The charge seems to last for about one and a half nights. It takes a charge really well is what I'm saying. They're Bluetooth. And I sleep right next to my husband. He can't even hear them. The actual earphones are little thin flat discs on either side sewn into the headband. The headband is large and it still doesn't fit me. The discs ride forward of my ears. I don't believe they're bone conduction. I believe they're meant to rest on your ears, but still. I just realized I thought I was having a flicker of a problem with mine, so I bought a new pair. They cost 20 bucks on Amazon, the ones I use. They work great. There are more rigid styles. I really like the loose flexibility, the polyester headband. Bonus points, it's warm in the winter. It's actually like wearing a hat to bed. And so I really, really enjoy mine. So I gave you the link and a picture of it. It looks rigid in the picture on the box. It's not. Hooray, we're at the blather. Minerva's doing great. She's growing back her tummy fur. It's a very slow process. 
She spends a lot of time with me. She peed all over a chair in the living room. We haven't figured that one out yet since I'm really working hard on cleaning out the litter box daily. We just don't know what, what set her off. But it might be the puppy who is enjoying just chasing her for fun. Never hurts her, never bites her, never tries to mouth her. Just bounds up to her. That is what Captain does to all of us. Bounds up to us. She is boisterous. The pup date, we have been on and off again about whether she's in heat. But I took her to the vet today for her pre-spay exam. And we changed vets because the last vet screwed up the post-op meds so much that I was frightened. So we went back to a vet we know who overcharges, but will do the job properly because this dog needs to be neutered. So I took her in today and we found out she gets hysterical about going in the car. She hates the car. Usually I take the big girl dogs with us to encourage her and today I didn't, so I had to lift her into the car. At which point I discovered she weighs 58.2 pounds. But we got her to the vet and she gets neutered on the 22nd. So that's really, really nice. Classes. I finally stopped taking classes. I think I got to a total of 115 hours. I only needed 36. I still have to do six more hours of law and ethics within the next two years. And I have the course on my computer. But I was really getting stale on sitting through classes. So I thought I should stop. So no more for a while. Meanwhile, you all say, what happened to my spouse? He has perfect vision. It's very, wow. He's walking around without his big heavy glasses. He does wear reading glasses that when they do these lenses, they try to do graduated lenses in your eyes when they do this surgery. But it is very hard to get the trifocals right. So he, he got the most expensive lenses, but still has to use reading glasses. But considering that he bought them at Walgreens for 10 bucks, I think we're all pretty happy about that. And he looks really cute in them. It looks totally different. And if you look in the show notes, you will see a picture of the beloved son wearing my husband's outdoor sunglasses that they require him to wear for a few more weeks while his eyes heal. But everything went really well. And we're both now talking about when I get it done, when I get it done. I'll be scared out of my mind is the answer, but it is pretty cool. So Minerva gets the last word and the last word is happy National Crochet Month. Minerva is one of the biggest connoisseurs of my crocheting that could possibly exist. She spends much of the day lying on the crocheted blanket I made to go with the love seat that's in my study or lying on the temperature blanket. She makes no bones about it. We have had all sorts of blankets on our big queen size bed in the master bedroom. She loves the temperature blanket. She loves the acrylic yarn. She finds it soft. I am absolutely convinced that cats have an excellent sense of color and color coordination because all my cats used to preferentially lie on the colored fabric that looked best with their coat color. So no matter what furniture you have in the house, my beautiful cat Guinevere, who was a silvery gray with a long coat and pumpkin colored and cream colored patches, and it would lie on the colonial blue furniture. She would not lie on the red or orange furniture. That I swear to you, my cats have been color coordinating themselves their whole lives. Our little tough guy, Tomcat Doe, of much lamented memory, he was a dusty brown. And he would lie on the red stuff, but he really didn't look good on the colonial blue and he didn't lie on it. And you can say it was territorial, but it wasn't. No matter where we moved, no matter what our furniture was, the cats were always color coordinated. Now, of course, Minerva is a beautiful black cat with slight shades of brown rustiness where her coat oxidized in sunlight. And she looks stunning on the temperature blanket. And I keep taking pictures of her on it because I just love the way she looks on it. But she makes no bones about it. She now sleeps on it all day and most of the night. She just loves being on that blanket. So Minerva's last word is, you're a knitter and you don't know how to crochet. Why? And all I would say to that, too, is my cat has excellent taste, of course. But while you might, may not crochet to the extent that I do, or you may crochet even more than I do, like I drew the line at Tunisian 
I've learned it several times. I just don't seem to retain it, but I just don't feel driven enough to, to really get good at it. And I don't know why, to be honest, because heaven knows Lexicom's making it look terrific every day. And she's got a whole crocheted wardrobe and she looks sensational. And she's, well, of course, she's a great designer as well. Something I'm not. But at any rate, you know, you may, you don't have to go that far in crochet, but crocheting is so versatile and I hate to say it more so than knitting. Now, knitting is the fabric I like for clothing. I have to be honest, but that hasn't stopped me from crocheting those vests in acrylic and I do love them. They look really cool and I really like them and they're really easy. And let's face it, I can crochet that vest in a week or less. Well, I can crochet a full sweater in a week and it takes me at least a month of intensive work to knit a sweater. So, you know, you have to make your decisions. Um, I think most of the time when people complain about crocheted garments, they're right because the designer is using a yarn that is too big for the job. I think many crochet designers say, oh, well, when you knit a sweater, you use a size four yarn or size three yarn. It's Lexicom who taught me sweaters look great in a fingering weight yarn when you crochet them. And it doesn't take that long because it's crochet. So, you know, I think we don't give it enough credit, but I also think if you want to knit in three dimensions, like a stuffed animal, crochet way faster. If you want to crochet a baby blanket, you know, you're going to use acrylic because kids are going to puke and poop and everything else on it. Acrylic and real fast. I always make people mommy shawls when they go into the hospital to give birth. Or even if they stay home, really. But I'll make them a mommy shawl and I do it in acrylic because... It's a messy business that the baby's going to get stuff on it and you might vomit on it. And all I can tell you is my mommy shawl went into surgery with me when I had the C-section. They let me have it around my neck and shoulders in the OR. It was a wonderful experience. I literally gave birth on mine, I guess I would say. So that's really great. And again, cheap yarn, cheap blankets, cheap whatever. There's a lot to be said. If you have an office and you want to quickly put a throw in your office, you just crochet it, and you don't worry what your patients do to it. So I'm a, just a big fan of crochet, and it can be used for just about anything that knitting can be used for. The trick is not to mistake the fabrics as being the same, that crocheting is a much heavier fabric and works really well with lighter yarns than you would use for the same project in knitting. But it's terrific for speed, and it's beautiful, and it's easy to learn. And bonus points, if you learn how to do a simple blanket stitch at the edge of any blanket or sleeve or whatever, it's very easy to crochet into that and add lace as a trim. When I was a kid, everybody where I grew up did that with their pillowcases. You bought plain colored pillowcases, you blanket stitched in a pretty embroidery floss, and then you would crochet with the same floss a pretty lace edging. And it was considered what you did as wedding presents. You gave everybody simple and expensive cotton pillowcases and sheets, but you embroidered a hem by using the blanket stitch at the edge and then you crocheted lace onto it. So, you know, out there in my Amish slash Quaker childhood, that was the way you did it. So, okay, happy National Crochet Month from me and from my dear Minerva. And I think all I'm going to say is remember, use your best good sense when it comes to COVID. That if you're me, you are. Now, Pfizer today introduced the idea we need a fourth shot, which I'm fine with. I, I just don't care at this point. It's just a flu shot for me. And so, I don't know. What I would say is get your vaccines, get your boosters, wear your mask, wash your hands, socially distance, if we're really through with COVID, which I really seriously doubt, but if we're through enough with it, whatever that means, we've learned some new tricks to keep ourselves healthy. I don't know about you, but I haven't had a head cold in two years and I have missed that like, well, like I would miss having somebody drive a stake through my foot. So, you know, use your common sense, okay? But in the meantime, everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. 
If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.